I recently published a video where I shared my opinions about the coronavirus pandemic and how it might impact people with multiple sclerosis. In this companion video, I'm going to speak specifically about each of the MS disease modifying therapies and how they may increase or decrease a given person's risk to get coronavirus. If you'd like to better understand how your DMT may play a role in your risk profile, don't turn away, because that starts right now. Howdy! Thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. I started this YouTube channel to help my own MS clinic patients learn between visits, and it's my hope that through these videos, I can help you learn too. If you're impacted by MS and you want to up your game, please consider subscribing to the channel. And make sure to ring that notifications bell so you don't miss any of my upcoming content. A few days ago, I published a video on Coronavirus Disease 2019, or COVID-19, and how it may impact people with multiple sclerosis. I spoke generally about risk factors such as age, comorbid conditions, the region of the world where you live, and I talked a little bit about disease-modifying therapies. In this follow-up video, I'm going to do a much deeper dive and look at each of the MS disease-modifying therapies and how they may impact a given person's risk. But first, allow me to mention three disclaimers. I am not giving you medical advice or medical recommendations. I'm providing medical education and information. Nothing I say on my YouTube channel trumps what your provider tells you specifically about you. And I strongly encourage you to talk to your provider about what is the right medical decision for you. My video is intended to up your game and provide information to facilitate that conversation. Please keep that in mind. Question of the day number one. If you have MS and you're concerned about coronavirus, the safest option is to stop your current DMT. True or false? Jot down your answer and stay tuned to the end of the video to find out the correct response. Question of the day number two. Which is more effective in preventing infection? Wearing a mask in public or washing your hands? Is the answer option number one, wearing a mask, or option number two, washing your hands? Again, please jot down your answer and stay tuned to the end of this video to find out the correct response. Just last month, the World Health Organization named a new disease, Coronavirus Disease 2019, or COVID-19. It's a virus caused by a coronavirus, which has not been previously identified. It's not the same thing as the coronaviruses that commonly circulate amongst humans and cause the common cold. In fact, it's thought to be a cousin of SAR-associated coronavirus, not the same as SARS, but related. Coronavirus disease 2019 started in China and has spread throughout the world, and it's causing a proper pandemic. The symptoms are mild to severe with death and can involve fever, cough, and shortness of breath. The onset is typically delayed by two to 14 days after exposure. And we have identified that there's an increased risk of mortality as compared to the common influenza. The current risk of mortality with coronavirus is between two and 3%. And we have identified that people that are a bit older in age and have comorbid conditions may be at increased risk of mortality. If you haven't checked out my first video on coronavirus disease, I'll throw a link up above so that you can check that out. In brief summary, we've identified certain risk factors which place a given person at being increased risk of becoming infected compared to someone else. Those risk factors include geography. Right now, there are certain endemic areas around the world. These include China, Japan, Korea, Northern Italy, and Iran. The situation, however, is rapidly evolving by the day, and so we want to make sure that you're staying up to date with the local evolving risk. A second risk factor is age. We've identified that people who are chronologically older have an increased risk of mortality associated with coronavirus compared to a younger population. A third risk factor is comorbid conditions, and so people that are medically ill are at increased risk. And lastly, we have to consider your exposure risk and your occupation. Are you a world traveler going through endemic areas? Are you a healthcare provider where you're at increased risk of exposure? Now, many of you watching have a keen focus on coronavirus as it relates to multiple sclerosis. And I wanna spend the rest of this video really focusing our attention on people impacted by MS. Now, having multiple sclerosis in and of itself 
is not an independent risk factor for contracting coronavirus or having a worse time dealing with it unless you are significantly disabled from your MS. If you have advanced multiple sclerosis or have accrued significant disability, where you have decreased mobility of your arms and legs, decreased uh, difficulty in expanding your chest cavity, you may be at increased risk. It is important, however, to remember that all of the FDA-approved MS disease-modifying therapies work by altering the immune response in one fashion or another. And as a consequence, an individual's ability to fight off an infection, like the coronavirus, may be impaired because of the MS medicine that they're taking. Now, each of these medicines work differently, and so we can't make blanket comments that all medicines create a problem or all medicines are safe. And in fact, I think it's worthwhile to talk about each of the MS disease-modifying therapies in course. And so let's do that now. Category of medicines I would like to discuss are immune reconstituting therapies, or medicines that reboot the immune response. These are medicines like Lymtrada, Mavenclad, and procedures like stem cell transplantation. Now with these medicines, the risk is temporal, or it's temporally related, meaning the way that these medicines first work is they deplete the immune response. They suppress your immune response. And during that phase of treatment, an individual will be at increased risk of infection. Later, there is a reconstitution of the immune response. In other words, you rebuild your immune response. And once your immune system is back in place, you are no longer at increased risk. So a year or two after each of these therapies, so a year or two following Lemtrada, or in the few years following cladribine, or after a stem cell transplant, an individual human will be at increased risk. But if you look at that same person three or four years later, that risk is no longer there. Now speaking generally, we would like the absolute lymphocyte count to be above one. The next category of medicine are the S1 P1 receptor modulators. These are medicines like Gelinia and Mazent, as well as a couple of medicines that are quickly coming down the pipeline like Ozanamod or Punisamod. Now, Gelinia and Mazent in clinical trials have been associated with an increased risk of respiratory infections. And so someone taking this medicine might be at slight increased risk of developing uh, coronavirus or having trouble clearing coronavirus compared to if they weren't. If you live in an endemic area, we might need to talk to your provider about coming off of these medicines. But if you don't live in an endemic area, I'm unlikely to make that be our suggestion. Again, before you make any changes, you have to talk to your provider about what's right for you. The next group of medicines I'd like to talk about are the fumaric esters. So these are medicines like dimethylfumarate, tecfidera, and diroximal fumarate, fumarity. And these medicines don't function as an immunosuppressant normally. So the way that we believe they work is not by suppressing the immune response. Most people taking these medicines are not going to be at increased risk of coronavirus. However, in about 20% of people that take Tecfidera, they have a side effect where their absolute lymphocyte count is dropped. This is not the intention of the medicine, but if it happens, they are in fact slightly immunosuppressed. And if that occurs, these individuals would be at increased risk. So in order to understand your given risk of coronavirus or susceptibility to coronavirus while taking Tecfidera, we have to know what your white blood cell count is doing and specifically what the absolute lymphocyte count is doing. If your absolute lymphocyte count is above 0.8, I'm feeling pretty okay. If your lymphocyte count is below 0.8, I'm concerned about immunosuppression and increased risk. The next drug I'd like to discuss is Abagio or teraflutamide. And this is arguably one of the most interesting drugs to discuss. It works in a cytostatic fashion, and that's a doctor term for it doesn't kill cells, it just kind of makes them play the freeze game. And when you stop a Baggio, they can pick back up. Also, there are some really interesting studies suggesting that a Baggio might in fact have antiviral properties. And so, whereas I think a Baggio is one of the lowest risks when considering coronavirus, it actually may have a leg up. It actually may be helpful. Similar to Abagio, I don't feel that the interferon beta products or Copaxone place a given individual at increased risk. So if you're taking Plegardy or Avonex or Rebif or Extadia or beta serin or Copaxone, I don't think that this places you at increased risk of fighting off coronavirus. Now, some people might say, well, in that case, should we switch from what we used to be taking onto one of these medicines? And I think the answer is no. 
If you've escalated to a more effective medicine, it's generally because your MS needed it, because you suffered breakthrough disease, or there were good neurological reasons. And this brings up a really good point. We don't want to ignore the benefit of a given medicine. And with all of the medicines I've mentioned, we're talking a lot about risk. But we have to keep in mind the benefit-risk ratio. And we take these medicines because we want to prevent future bad events in the setting of multiple sclerosis. What I don't want us to do is to ignore the benefit side of the equation. And please, let's keep in mind the benefit risk of a given drug inside the context of the risk of treating multiple sclerosis. In summary, MS disease modifying therapies alter the immune response. And as such, people taking them might be at increased risk of difficulties surrounding coronavirus. But all the medicines work differently and it's not one size fits all. The highest risk would be the immunodepleters. In other words, these immune reconstitution therapies, cladribine, lemtrada, and stem cell transplantation during the depletion phase, during those first couple years, would place the person at highest risk. Interestingly, when the same drugs, when you look three and four years out, they probably have the lowest risk. We think about drugs like the B-cell depleters in Gelinia, which are known in the setting of clinical trials to increase the risk of upper respiratory tract infections and may create a risk, which is particularly relevant if you're in an endemic area. Medicines like Tecfidera and Vumeridae are more complex because not every patient has immunosuppression as a result of taking this medicine. So if you're on one of those medicines and your white count's normal, no worries. If you're on one of the medicines and the white count is low, you might be at risk. Medicines like Abagio and the injectable medicines probably have lower risk profile. And one of the more confusing medicines is Tysabri because it's unclear whether coronavirus 2019 easily enters into the brain or not. And the most important note to take away from this video is that you should not stop or delay your disease modifying therapy on your own. This is a discussion that must occur with your provider and together as a team, you'll make the right decision for you. Keep in mind that cold turkey stopping Tysabri or Gelinia can result in a rebound and that's bad news bears. We certainly don't want to go there. Also keep in mind that we can quite literally mitigate risk of infection by using proper hygiene maneuvers and by avoiding high risk travel. This is super important and much more relevant than starting or stopping a medicine. To that end, let me go through nine tips, things that you can do to mitigate risk of infection. Number one, sanitize your hands or wash your hands with soap and water. But if you use soap and water, you literally need to wash for 20 seconds. That's very important. You want to make sure that you're sanitizing or washing your hands before you eat, after you go to the bathroom, after you blow your nose, cough or sneeze. And if your hands are visibly dirty, there's dirt on them, then you definitely want to use soap and water. Number two is to cover your mouth and nose when you cough or sneeze. Ideally, cough or sneeze into a tissue, throw the tissue in the trash can, and then sanitize your hands. Similarly, try to avoid touching your nose, mouth, and face. If you touch a surface that has virus and then you touch your nose, mouth, or face, you can introduce virus into your body. By simply not touching your face, you can decrease the risk. Number four is to stay home if you're sick. Don't trudge through and go to work where you can infect other people. And number five, obviously I want you to avoid sick contacts to decrease your risk of becoming infected. Number six is to disinfect surfaces that are commonly touched. And this is a good idea in your house. This is a good idea in your work. I had a viewer comment that it would be a good idea to desanitize your cane. And that's an excellent point. Number seven is to stay fit and maintain a healthy lifestyle. Because if you are fit, you're going to handle a viral insult much, much better. Number eight is get your flu shot. People with MS benefit from getting a flu shot. Of course, you need to check with your provider to make sure that's safe for you. And as I talked about in my last video, wearing a mask, a regular mask that you buy at a pharmacy does not decrease your risk, but washing your hands does. And now to answer the question of the day. If you have MS and you're concerned about coronavirus, the safest option is to stop your DMT. The answer is false. That's actually a really, really bad idea and I do not want you to do that. 
On the contrary, I want you to contact your provider and discuss specific recommendations of what's best for you. Don't stop cold turkey and don't stop on your own. And now for the answer to the second question of the day. Which is more effective in preventing infection, wearing a mask in public or washing your hands? The answer is washing your hands. Thank you for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. If you haven't checked out my first coronavirus video, I'll throw a link up above so that you can check that out. YouTube Analytics thinks that you would love this video right here, so you might want to look at that one. And if you haven't yet subscribed to my channel, please consider doing so. Just click that circle with my face on it. Go ahead, click my face. Until my next video or my next live stream or the next time I see you in clinic, this is Aaron Boster saying take care.